Dr. Niall Smith. He's one of the founders of Blackrock Castle Observatory. He's very, very heavily involved, absolutely passionate about astronomy and astrophysics. He's the um, director of research in CIT as well. And so with a very sceptical team, and I'm not even quite sure what you're going to bring up, <laughs> so this is taking a massive risk now, um, I'll hand it over to you. Thanks very much. Yes, for that. Science is something which, um, as Tom says, I personally am passionate about, and before trying my own little hand at doing a little bit of science by changing a couple of wires so I can get my computer onto the thing here <laughs> and see whether that actually works or not, um, I thought I'd just mention a little story which I always like, which was um, from a physicist called Richard Feynman. For those of you who don't know about Feynman, um, a more arrogant man you couldn't meet, uh, but possibly the only person justified to be as arrogant as he was, because Feynman started off, as he put it himself, as a child prodigy and got better. Um, so, uh, but he did point out that he had a number of friends who were not in the same class uh, as, as he was. Uh, and he had a conversation one day with an artist friend of his. And the artist friend said to him, you know, Richard, he said, I really feel sorry for you because I'm an artist. And when I look at the flower in front of me, he says, I see so much. I see the beauty. I see the color. I see the shade. He says, I see the form. I see the evolution of the flower in front of me. And Richard says, well, I feel sorry for you because... When I look at the flower, I see the beauty, the colour, the shade, I see the form, I see the evolution of it. And then I think of the electrons inside it that go to form up the atoms, and the atoms that bind together, and the, the forces that do that, and the amazingness of the strong force. In the and he said his friends started to glaze over at this stage, <laughs> and he said, OK, on this one you win. And in a sense, that's what science should be about. It should in no way... Uh, Criticise, nor should it in any way jeopardise your um, ability to enjoy the universe of which you are a part. And in, in, the, in the thing early on, the, 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 the Minchin thing, which I thoroughly enjoyed, but I thought it was absolutely brilliant, um, the idea that life is short um, and is to be there to be enjoyed. And I, I have to say, uh, before becoming a little bit sceptical, um, that I feel very privileged. I think we're all very privileged to actually be part of the universe, a part of the universe, that, that realises it's part of the universe. I'm making the assumption that the rocks around me don't actually know they're part of the universe. Maybe they do. But it's a very special place to be, and it's also a very special time, I think, in the evolution of our species to be alive. Um, some of us are old enough to have been allowed to, 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 to get up to watch man walk on the moon, and yes, that really did happen. That's not the subject of my talk tonight. <laughs> Uh, brief talk, incidentally, um, and to see that and to go from basically a situation where we were stuck on this planet to, to walking on another planet, to being able to talk within moments with anybody else on the surface of the planet, and also to be able to do things with technology which literally would have been magic even in our fathers and days, let alone our grandfathers' days. So this period of change has been driven by one thing which I think is really good to see for us, and that is healthy scepticism allied to uh, a lack of unbounded scepticism. It seems not everything, and this is something I think Colin was getting at, is up for grabs in the universe in which we live. For the most part, if I take this pen... I can have a fairly good prediction what's going to happen if I let it go. I actually can't be 100% sure, and I'm going to come back to that uh, in a couple of minutes' time, but I would like to reasonably predict that I know that that's what's going to happen. And you all know that's pretty much what's going to happen. But we also have the physical basis to explain why that's happened and to predict how that will happen. You use that same physical basis to predict what happens if you do it the other way, and now, if you're smart, you use that same physical basis to send men and women someday to the moon and beyond. So understanding some things and accepting that everything isn't open to complete criticism, that the universe does appear to work by certain rules, works to your advantage and takes nothing away from who you are as an individual or your ability as a person during your life to enjoy the universe of which... I say we're all privileged to be a part. So I've chosen as my topic 
the dragon in my garage, and you can see the dragon in the garage here in front of you, um, or not, as the case may be. And I've taken the idea of that from a book by my favourite author and scientist, uh, well, non-fictional author, Carl Sagan, although he did write some fiction as well. And this particular book is called The Demon Haunted World, Science as a Candle in the Dark. And it does actually have a couple of chapters on scepticism, but the, the whole balance of the book for me, I remember when I read it, I thought, oh my goodness. First of all, I, I hated Carl Sagan because he wrote so well, but you get over that. You know, <laughs> you can't go around your, all your life thinking, I hate people who are better than me. And you should spend a lot of time being hateful. What will I spend a lot of time being hateful? So you say, okay, he's better than me at writing, but actually, one thing that I realised was he, he really did seem to reflect, so of course I'm going to like him, as, I guess in a sense, views that I had come across by debate with my friends when I was sort of so high. We used to talk about things and wonder at things and question and all the rest. And a lot of the things that we came up with were, were not necessarily correct. But we started out early on in life with this idea of asking the question. And one thing that Carl Sagan says, and I want you to... Feel free to interrupt at any stage, by the way, in this presentation. Uh, was that there are no, as he put it, authorities in science. There's nobody can come up and simply sort of stand on a chair and say, because I'm taller than you, and I'm, my name is doctor or professor or Nobel Prize winner, that I'm right and you're wrong. I may be right. I may be wrong. If you're right, then ultimately that rightness will win out over the, if you like, the humanity of which we're part. So I like that, because ultimately science, it's the ultimate in socialism, if you want to put it that way. Uh, and it is the ultimate which says that we can make progress by working together. And people, while in reality, of course, and it's a bit of a sad reality, may take the credit for your idea or you know, your promotion and all those sort of things that go on within society. Nevertheless, I sometimes like to think that you know, when I put my head on my, my pillow at night, have I done right that day by my views, or have I not? And I think science encourages you to do right by your views. Incidentally, right by your views doesn't mean to everybody else's views. Of course, you have to listen, because you might be wrong. You might realise, well, oh, actually, no, I'm wrong. So I want to start off with this idea, which Carl Sagan postulates about the dragon in my garage. Um, and, oh yes, just before that, this isn't ex exactly hugely sceptical, but this telephone is an amazing invention, but who would want to use one of them? <laughs> now that's a little bit sceptical, and that's an American president from 1876, and you can get also other minor scepticisms, like the British Parliamentary Society set up to investigate electric lighting, Edison's electric light bulb is good enough for our transatlantic friends, but unworthy of practical or scientific men. Now, you can, you can almost hear the intonation that would have been used in that sort of statement. And it sort of underlines then, if you like, the sort of the scepticism about technology and, and motion forward and where it might come from. And what's kind of nice about this is that no matter whether you're a fancy society or a, very, or a president of the most powerful country in the world, if you're wrong, you're wrong. So... It's, it's about trying to understand how most of the time we get to be right. But I'm going to just ask about, before coming to the Dragon My Guys to begin with, about being really sceptical. Because there's some things that we're kind of saying, well, we should really be sceptical about when people talk about these things. And I want to question that scepticism in a minute, okay? Because otherwise, what's the point? We all just all the time agree with another, <laughs> no fun. So, it would be reasonable to say, come on, guys, there's no such things as ghosts. There's no such things as the paranormal. Bigfoot, come on, fairies, psychics, alien abductions. Clearly, these are all hogwash. They can't exist. People who talk about them are simply mad. So let's imagine we have that tenet. And that's what we think. Well, if we're going to be somehow different, we need to have a, a, a reason why we would say that. But it's not quite as simple, I think, as, as it might seem. And, and I'll try to explain with a, with a simple experiment in a couple of minutes uh, something which is really interesting to me. But let me not <laughs> rush too far ahead. You know what I said to me. <laughs> so anybody who falls asleep during my presentation is not coming back to Bangkok Castle Observatory. 
<laughs> yeah, but that's because I'm about to be lost. <laughs> Don't mention the public place and all that, you know. So, so okay. So first of all, we start with this dragon thing. So, um, I, I'm trying to keep out of because there's a couple of sentences here. So this is basically it. Somebody says, I meet this friend of mine. He says, a fire-breathing dragon lives in my garage. So, suppose, and I'm following a group therapy approach. This is now from Carl Sagan's book by the psychologist Richard Frank, that I seriously make such an assertion to you. So surely you'd want to check it out, see for yourself. That'd be fairly reasonable, there's a dragon in somebody's garage. There have been innumerable stories of dragons over the centuries, no real evidence, so my goodness, this is an amazing opportunity, that my friend has a dragon in his garage, so this is great news. So off we go, show me, you say, I lead you to my garage, you look inside and see a ladder, empty paint cans, an old tricycle, but no dragon. So, where is the dragon, you ask? Oh, she's right here. I reply, waving vaguely, important. I neglected to mention that she's an invisible dragon. <laughs> ah, so you propose, because you're thinking this is still cool, spreading flour on the floor of the garage to capture the dragon's footprints. Ah, good idea, I say, but this dragon floats in the air. So thinking, okay, then we'll use an infrared sensor to detect the invisible fire. You're probably starting to change your view on your friend at this moment in time. Ah, uh, good idea, but the invisible fire is also heatless. So you're kind of thinking, okay, you'll spray paint the dragon, and that'll make her visible. Uh, yes, that's another good idea, but she's an incorporeal dragon, and the paint won't stick and so on, and so on. So every physical test you propose has a special one-off, effectively, explanation of why it won't work. So you'll be reasonably sure that you should be sceptical about this particular assertion. So you would presumably start to figure out why your friend thinks this dragon exists. Now, I think if the friend was very young, I know my sister had an invisible friend at the bottom of the garden called Toby, and we named a, a dog of ours after Toby in, in memory of Toby, but she was convinced of Toby, but quite frankly we didn't really take her seriously, and I'm not suggesting that there was an invisible friend at the bottom of my sister's garden. But it's an interesting thing that lots, you hear lots of young people talk about their invisible friends. I don't know if any of you have one. I don't want to know, actually, <laughs> but I didn't um, uh, have one. Never had many friends, really, but <laughs> that's a different presentation, I mean. Um, so the, the, the thing is that here we have a problem, but now suppose Satan goes on to say that a couple of your other friends also claim they have the same issue in, the, in, the, in their garage. So you now have a whole series of friends suggesting they have these invisible and untestable dragons. Are you then beginning to feel outside of it as somehow... There's something about you that's different or something about you that is uh, disconnected from the rest of the world around you. But it's reasonable for you, no matter how you feel threatened in this instance, to suggest that there is something fundamentally wrong when there is no experiment which can verify one way or the other the reality or otherwise of this putative dragon. So let's move away then for a minute from the dragons and because we're in Blackrock Castle, we ask, what is the stars? And the famous Sean o from Junior and the Peacock by Sean O'Casey. I often looked up at the sky and asked myself the question, what is the moon? What is the star? 